a horse I rode for my dad years ago and uh, I was doing light on him and um, I had to borrow Paul's saddle. So I borrowed <laughs> Paul's saddle and I'm up on him in the prey ring and I can't put the bloody steers down. <laughs> she riding up the neck and I'm heading out looking at dad and dad was like, now out the back now, tip away or whatever. And I was like, yeah, can you just run in and get me? <laughs> Welcome along to a very special episode of From the Horse's Mouth. It is the punters panel. Yes, we've asked you to give us questions for our panel. The usual duo of Ruby Walsh and Rory DeLarge are here. But to put a bit of flair on the occasion, we've brought in Nina Carberry as well. So we've got questions for all three. If you're listening to this podcast, great. If you want to watch it, I would urge you to check out the Paddy Power Racing YouTube channel. There's also a really good documentary. Can we call it a documentary? Have you seen it, Ruby? The, the, the Shark Hanlon one where they go over to Shark Hanlon? No, when no? I clicked on, I had to subscribe. Oh, very so good, very it. good, Ruby. Click subscribe. Did you, did you comment? No, I had to subscribe to comment too. Yeah, well, you should do that. You should. And like it, Ruby. <laughs> if you like it as well, subscribe and comment on that Paddy Power Racing YouTube channel. Do check out the Shark Power documentary. It's really good. We sent Paddy down to uh, John Joseph Hanlon, no known as the Shark, uh, Hewick, going for the Gold Cup. Really good stories there. Welcome to the panel, Nina in particular. Thank Great you. to have you here. Thank you. How'd you get roped into this one? Does a brother in law give you a ring? <laughs> Not so much, but uh, no, delighted to be here anyway. Brilliant. Should be so, a bit of fun. That should be a bit of fun, unfortunately. It's going to be, the questions don't come from me. It's all from our loyal then listeners. It could be fun. <laughs> yeah. All from our loyal listeners. Let's get cracking. Our first question comes from Damien Brown. Hi, how's it going? Uh, I have a question for all three of you. Uh, so, Ruby and Nina, I'm just wondering what's the best horse you've ever ridden? And Rory, what's the best horse you've ever seen in the flesh? Thanks for that question, Damien. Very good. Straight to you, Ruby Walsh. Get a star. Easy. Was that an easy answer? Yeah. Explain why, please. Do I really yeah, you might to? have to. Yeah, you might. Well, he asked for it. He asked for an answer. He might want a bit of context. Five King George's, two Gold Cups, four Betfair Chases, top rated horse, horse in the one season, over two miles, two and a half miles, three miles. Do He left out Tingle Creeks. Yeah, but do I have to keep going? Left something out. He left something <laughs> out. <laughs> so, Kato Star, Nina? It has to be Don Cossack for me. Gold Cup horse, so run three bumpers on him. And uh, one particular day I rode him, it was in Navin, and Rory O'Mara, who was a bumper horse at the time, had won a previous race, and he... He went about a furlong clear and I said, this fella is going to have to be a great one horse to win. And sure enough, he was. I just got up on the line towards the end. So he, he got me out of jail as well that day. He was a good horse. Did you know back then when you sat on Don Cossack, not only is he a great one horse, but this fella is going to win an open championship race at Chatham? I didn't know, but I thought he was a great one horse, to be yeah. honest. He got me out of trouble that day in a way. And normally the great one horses normally do. Yeah, he was, he was a good one, all right. So we've had Kodo Star, Kato Star from Ruby. We've had Don Cossack uh, from Nina. I'm nearly forgetting you, but Damien did ask Rory DeLarge, what was the best horse you've ever seen in the flesh? Yeah, no one's asked me what the best horse I've ridden was, which is disappointing. <laughs> the answer to that is a, is a big piebald called Yugi. Oh, yeah? What yeah. did he win? He didn't win an awful lot, in fairness, <laughs> but he was... But he got you around? He was, he was game. Yeah, okay. Uh, he got he me got, around a bit. Uh, um, the best I've seen in the flesh, well, Kodo Star goes uh, very, very close oh. between him and Sprinter Sacra, I guess. Oh, really? So, so Sprinter Sacra? of him in the flesh, yeah. Uh, in one particular performance? His, uh, his um, first champion chase was, was the big performance, but the second champion chase, given that all that had gone before, was very special just because he was able to do it. He was a much better horse first time around, but the story was terrific second time. You know Barry Garrity, you two, better than, than, than us. He always, whenever he's asked about Sprinter Sacker and Moscow Flyer, he always says, Moscow Flyer beat everything, never got to the ballroom, Sprinter Sacker, classy. Do you think he's telling the truth here, or do you think he's got a favourite between Nina? I'd, I'd imagine probably, he probably, I'd, I'd imagine he always had a, a big relationship with, with the whole Jessica and Harrington and everything. Mm -hmm. I think being a, an Irish horse coming from, from home to winning in Cheltenham is probably a bit more to it, I think, for him. Yeah. Uh, when he stayed on, of course, he, was, he, was, he had that terrible record of alternating falls with wins, F, didn't he? One, yeah, one, yeah. One, 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 so brilliant. Yeah. So the pie bold again. What was the name of the pie bold? Yogi. Yogi, named yeah. after Breisner. Possibly. Okay. Possibly. All right. Okay. Right. Great question, Damien. Thank you very much for that. It's uh, more like the bear. Oh, good. Could have been. Yeah. Yeah. yeah could have been. Probably. Yeah. Yogi bear. I didn't name him. Just really. You know. Okay. Uh, how long did you have him for? 
I didn't have it at all. I rode them at university. Okay. Uh, at university? Yes. Explain. I, who was, rides horses at university? Well, people who join riding clubs at oh. university. Okay. So I, I, I didn't do an awful lot of riding at home and joined a riding club at university and Yogi was my regular partner there. There's definitely a joke in here about riding clubs at universities. I was in the bar anyway, so that, that. Well, Yogi, fair play, right. That's a great question, as I said, from uh, Damien Brown. Next question, we go to Sam Matthews. In your opinion, who are the best claiming jockeys to keep on your side in the handicaps and um, the boys' races at the festival? Thank you, Sam Matthews, in a tractor. It, I, I think it was, I think it was a John Deere, it was a green. Was it I, green, I, Rory? I didn't see any green, no. But, uh, I, um, I, I, he has tweeted us a few times and he's had the John Deere well, tractor. Go, yeah. He's a humble brag that he's got a John Deere. Great yeah, question John from Deere. Sam. Um, he mentions the boys' races at the festival, Rory. What's he mean by that? I, I think that would be a reference to the uh, to the Martin Pipe, ah, so the okay. conditional jockeys' events. Okay, so, right, to recap, best claiming jockeys to keep on your side, Rory? Uh, there's a very obvious one here in, in Michael O'Sullivan, who's been winning grade ones this season, but still claims five pounds. So he'll be top of the tree in terms of... Um, uh, of um, trainers looking for a claimer uh, yeah. in those races. I'll throw out one of uh, one English-based jockey who wouldn't be a household name by any manner of means. It's just one to watch out for the next next couple of years. I don't, I don't know what he'd pick up at the festival, but um, Luca Morgan's brother Bo okay. uh, is coming through the ranks. He's he's had a handful of winners of this season, but he looks very promising, um, and he might be one to watch out for the fu for the future. Okay. Right, so Sam, great question. Uh, nicely answered by Rory Michael Michael Sullivan. Who uh, just to go back to you, just go sorry to go to you, Nina, yeah. on Michael O'Sullivan. We've seen him in the Barry Connell silks. Is there potential arrangement? We don't know, but Barry Connell could say, "Don't waste your claim on anyone else." Does that happen in racing? Uh, listen, they can look after it. It happens a little bit on the flat. Um, a lot of the trainers kind of look after the apprentice because. They want to keep them for themselves. They've, mm. A lot of the apprentices probably run through their claim very quickly and don't don't get the experience they need, you know. So um, can happen. That can happen a little bit, but uh, who would you have then? So to, for back to Sam's question, claimers to follow. I'd agree with Michael Sullivan. I think he's a very very good rider, but he's got a good good head for it as well. Um, great person to interview after race and go through the race as well. Uh, Keen Quirk, I thought was quite eye catching at the Dublin Festival. Uh, he's riding for different yards and that's always a good sign. He's getting plenty of rides and uh, yeah, once you're riding in those big handicaps, you're, 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 you're learning all the time as well. So he'll be ready for Cheltenham, I'd imagine. I'd say he'll be snapped up. Okay, so Keen Quirk added to Michael O'Sullivan and Bo Morgan, Ruby Walsh. Yeah, you couldn't disagree with anything Nina and Rory have said. I always find it hard talking up young people. Um, you because say, you don't want to put them up there. Yeah, you put yeah, more pressure yeah. on them. Um, but I think Kieran Callahan is doing very well and William Mullins is thought he gave a horse a great ride in um, Limerick a fortnight ago on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, can't think of his name, a grey horse from Rich Ritchie's colours, but uh, I think he's ridden some big winners this year. And look, with the connection to the yard he's in, he's in Willie's a long time, he will get his opportunity in Cheltenham and that could lead to a, a good reward for him. Did he ride Captain Kangaroo? He did, to win the, to win the, the Cork Dana. National. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's in Willie's three, four years now and he's worked his way to where he is. So, you know, Willie... That's the kind of thing Willie likes, and yeah, he's you know he started there when he's fifteen, and he's he's working his way through it. What are these lads and lasses doing at the age of fifteen? Maybe Nina will come to you on this. What are you doing when you walk in as a fifteen-year-old into the yard? Like you're not getting straight up on horses, are you? Well, you would be, yeah. Yeah. But a lot of these people have, or uh, younger people have a bit of experience pony racing and that, so you're kind of used to getting up on different types of horses and that. But. Uh, but they're doing sweeping as well here now. Uh, yeah, that'd yeah. be a big thing in Willie's. Yeah. Like they'd be, they, obviously at 15 you can only work a certain amount of hours in the week and at 16 you can work a bit more, but like Willie would want to see that you're there to do all the jobs that everyone else has to do. And You'd be doing full days as well. Full days, from mucking out to doing over, going racing with the horses, sweeping the yards. You learn your trade from the bottom up and everyone's in a hurry these days. But yeah. Kieran Callahan has twigged that if I actually do the, the, make the progress that Willie wants, He's the first conditional to get a chance in Willie's, I'd say, since Paul Turnant. Okay. And that's when you're coming from work. Hard work. Goes well. And um, did you have to muck out after Yogi? Did, was that was that something you did? I didn't have to, but I did. Oh, I did I did get involved, yeah. I mean, I, I got get on the way. Get involved, that's I vague. got on the way a little bit more than I helped, <laughs> but I was, I was willing. Great question, Sam. Thanks very much. From the tractor. Working on the job. Good man, Sam. Uh, working and sending us questions. Right, next question is in from Philip Trainer. First question for Ruby. Um, 
the mare's hurdle race you've won eight times uh but with the current market if the top four showed up at the moment who would you prefer to ride and why great question philip as he mentioned this one is for ruby Philip mentions the top four in the market. I'm going to flesh it out a little bit. Ruby, Honeysuckle, Epitant, Marie's Rock, Brandy Love, Love Envoy or Envoy, and Echoes and Rain will be the top six. It's a good race, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. What's the potential to be a great race? Uh, looking at it, you'd have to think about it tactically. How's it going to work out? You could have six goals here and pick the wrong one. <laughs> I'd nearly chance Echoes and Rain. Echoes and Rain? I did not have you down for that one at all. Give us uh, your thinking behind it. I think there'll be a good gal out there to help her settle. Couple of those will go at each other. Just thinking of the other jockeys who'll be riding them, where they'll be getting involved. You could be watching it all happen in front of you there, and it goes and right till you get off the bend and be coming at whoever's left last. Free goer, as we know, that sort of challenge that kind of excites you, thinking I'll get her settled and I'll I'll show I, them that she. You, 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 you're just going to have enough of right horses in front of you, so you're not having to worry about honeysuckle getting off the front with a load of ordinary mare stuck in the middle. There's good mares all the way through that are going to keep, that are going to go and follow her. So even if you drop in, they're going to drag you into the race. You're not going to get the cop behind a load of dead wood and honeysuckle be gone in the distance. That's why she, as for a hold-up, she'd be an interesting right? Very good. Right, great question, Philip. But I am going to extend this. I know you said to Ruby only. So, Nina, if you had the chance, which of those six? Um, I'm going to go with honeysuckle. I don't think she's dropped in class too much. That... Um... I think they're giving her every chance to win at Cheltenham again and that'll be her last and uh, yeah I thought I thought she was going to get swallowed up to be honest in Leprechaun the last day turning in I thought she was going to get not even third so mm. uh, I thought uh, she impressed me coming up to the line she fought for that so um, no, I'm going to go and stick with her and uh, like obviously tactics as well but um, like she's, she's pretty tactically her. versatile anyway yeah, yeah, honey yeah. Uh, Rory who would you write given the option I'd, yeah I'd, not sure it would be a massive benefit, to be perfectly honest. Claiming how many? And if I was riding Yogi, <laughs> then I'd, I'd be taking the same route as Echoes and Rain. I'd be coming from behind on Yogi, but he might have too much to do. Um, I, th I think Epitone's probably the probably the most straightforward of them yeah. now. Um, you know, I, wasn't mad, I wasn't mad about her last year, but she seems to have re-established a level of form. And she, she's a pretty straightforward ride. Um, Marie's Rock can still pull uh, fairly hard and... Echoes and Rain for the race might set up nicely for her. It isn't the isn't a push button ride either. So I think the the easiest one, and I would need the easiest ride in the race, wouldn't I? <laughs> would probably be Epitone these days. Fair enough. Well, Philip, I know I gave the question to Nina and uh, Rory, but that shows you three different answers from six different horses. But an interesting one from Ruby Walsh regarding uh, Echoes and Rain. Right, next question. This one comes from Anya Flynn. Hi guys. Um, so my question um, revolves around the Triumph Riddle. So obviously Gallimer so um, was very impressive at the DRF and turned around the form at Lossy Mouth. But Lossy Mouth was potentially um, the most impressive loser of the whole weekend. If you were Paul Townend, who would you choose to ride in the Triumph? Lossy Mouth or Gallimer so? Excellent question. Thank you very much, Anya. If you listened to the Cheltenham Countdown podcast released earlier in the week, we had a great chat about this very topic Ruby Walsh and Rory DeLarge did. So I'm going to come to you, Nina, first on this one. Yeah, um, Lossy Mouth... She definitely lost a lot of ground that day, getting pulled back in behind. Um, she did have a hard race to come back into it and try to win her race, but Gallop and Dassault looked, I thought, it was impressive and improved a lot. Whether Lassie Mouse had a real hard race, and that's what Willie, I think, was a bit afraid of, that she got mm. a hard race, and would she keep progressing on to Cheltenham? That's your only worry, but definitely best horse for me was lost him out in the day and that's the one I'd be riding if so you're everything... Paul, you're Paul Tanner you're riding um, lost him out we mentioned that we were talking on the podcast earlier this week if Paul Tennant got off lost him out and rode Gal Marceau would that be a decision that would come from pride or would it be literally a case of he just thinks about the triumph hurdle he has to forget about what happened before I'd imagine he's probably choosing which is going better at the time like there's still another five weeks to go so mm -hmm. he's going to see and kind of I would imagine he's going to be watching them at home and seeing who's going better. You'd hope so. Ruby? Yeah, that's factoring in, but just like going basically on that they're both absolutely bombing and they have a perfect prep from here to Cheltenham and which one do you ride? I think he would ride Lossie Mount um, because I, think, I just think he'd ride Lossie Mount. And to go back to Orny's question, if you were Paul Tennant, who would you ride? 
Well, I didn't ride either at the Dublin Racing Festival, um, so I'd probably ride Blood Destiny. <laughs> oh my, like it's genuinely like pulling teeth with this fella on this thing. Um, okay, Rory, if you were Paul Townend, who would you write? I, th I think it's difficult for, for Paul to get off um, Lossy Mouth, given how things panned out. I think he, there, he's got a score to settle there. Yeah. Um, I think you can, you can make a kiss to Gallimard, so he's is essentially um, the same horse on paper. They've got a very similar chance. But because of what happened, I think you, you feel you need to put something right. And also the, the point that, that Ruby made when we discussed this earlier was how sick would he be if he could off Lossy Mouth and she won? I think sicker <laughs> than if Gallimar still won again. We did mention, we had a good chat about it, as I said, on Monday's uh, chat and countdown. Ruby Walsh, I'm sorry, blood destiny. Sorry, Anya, I'm sorry. I have to deal with this on a weekly basis. Okay, next question. Question is from David Atkinson. Question for Nina and Ruby. If there was one novice chaser and one novice hurdler they could ride for the Cheltenham Festival, which horses would they choose? Thanks very much, David. Ruby Walsh, one novice chaser, one novice herder, please. Um, I mean, the winner's PK. You are? So I would probably ride Mighty Potter. Okay. Thought he'd look rock solid at the Dublin Racing Festival and novice hurdlers. <laughs> um, Such an easy question two weeks ago, and now it seems to it be looked fairly obvious two weeks ago, um, and it's not so obvious now. I'd probably go with Imperi Pa in the Ballymore. Lovely. Okay, Nina. El Fabiano for the Arkle, and probably stick with him. Lost him out for the. Lost him out. Yeah, in the... that's not a novice. She's not technically. Thank you. Not She's not technically a novice. That's the triumph is not a novice. Okay. Technically, but it is. But of course, most triumph hurdle candidates tend to be novices. Ah, but she's not. Is she? not a novice. No. Oh, no. See, see, Nina. See. Well, hang on. Like, um, see, you see this fella more than I do, so you should be well used to this. <laughs> um, so we something go, in the Supreme, the Ballymore, uh, the Albert. The, uh, the Imperial or, National. Or, or, or you could. Or, or in a handicap hurdle. Three car brag in the Martin Pipe. Tree car bike. Or if, if Gaelic Warrior goes for a handicap, which looks unlikely now this unlikely, stage. Unlikely, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Nina. We're, so we're, what we're will Gaelic Warrior The gaffer, he's in Ballymore, Willie said. Ballymore. Um, Jumps a bit right for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like him to be You're grand, your grand with Marine National, is that? Marine yeah, Nas I think Marine yeah. National for me. I think he's rock solid. Okay. I think he's they're doing a great job this year. Suit to... you, take your time. Yeah. yeah. Tip away. Tip away. Follow Tip. everyone going in. Yeah. Stand, <laughs> stand in the moment his back. Not too much effort required. <laughs> no. you, you never would have got to ridden any of Barry Connell's horse and bumpers because he was still no. riding then yeah, at that exactly, stage, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, so you never got the chance. Yeah. Uh, Rory, who would you ride? Well, I'd only be able to ride uh, Yogi. Yogi, and he has not entered. So um, Getting more mentions than I mostly, thought. Uh, than anyone thought. Even to Willie Mullins, so he get plenty of entries. <laughs> he's, he'd be 36 now if he's alive. So okay. a, a, a pass of Rory's Loggy. Yeah. But uh, great question, David. Thank you very much for that. We move on to Matthew Twist. Hi, my name's Matt from Manchester, and I've got a question around the big handicap races. So how often, if at all, would trainers go out of the way to run their horses in less suitable races for the horse or run the horse when it's not quite at full fitness just to get that handicap rating down and then they've got more of a shot at the big purse in uh, in, in the big handicap race and that's also obviously good for for punters spotting a big odds winner further down the card thank you sorry matt it was uh, i called you matthew before the question all right cracking question that goes straight to rory delargy yeah, well, the, the, the context of the question is very interesting. He's talking about the big handicaps and um, how, how trainers would prepare horses for them. Um, the biggest problem you have, of course, getting horses in handicaps at Cheltenham is having them high enough rated to get in, the, in there in the first place. So this is not like preparing one for a class six at uh, Chelmsford. Um, this is a slightly different kettle of fish. So you need to, you need to ensure your horse is, is, um, uh, is qualified for the handicaps and is going to get in the weight. So you need to be sort of mid 130s and upwards to get in in the first place. So I think most trainers um, will be delighted to be able to get in there in the first place. It's possible you've got a horse who's, who's um, um, previously had, had a high level form and has, has been high in the handicap. And yeah, I mean, tra trainers are aware of the situation they're in then and they know that in order to be a, a bit more competitive, they're going to have to come down in the weights. But Usually horses like that who are not as good as they were, they just need to they need to race mm. to convince the handicap where they're not as good as they were. Um, you don't have to try anything funny with them. You just keep running them and they've got to gradually creep down the weights. 
But as we've seen um, in, in recent seasons, what you'll find a lot of the time is that trainers who've got horses they fancy for the, for the, um, the festival, they're running them multiple times. Look at Hunt Ball. He was running for the sort of seventh or eighth time of the season. He, he won his first, I think he's really at 67 or something like that when he, when he first went into handicaps um, and ended up, um, he had to run after the, the weights were in, after the weights were announced because the handicapper had, had said that he probably wouldn't get into the, uh, the novice's handicap. So he ran again and ended up running off top weight. Uh, we had presenting Percy had to run again. Um, Connections decided they had to run again because he might not get into the, the per temps. So you're finding trainers actually having to run the horses and win with them to get the chance of winning with them at the festival. Um, so, so there's less chicanery in that regard. The other thing to do, if you're looking, if you're if you've got a novice you want to run in the in the um, in the handicaps, again you've got to give them enough experience. But you might decide that your horse is a three miler, and if you campaign it at two and a half miles, you get a you get a handicap mark commensurate with its two and a half mile form. But you then run it at three miles, expecting improvement. That's a perfectly valid thing to do, and mm. it's it's a way of staying ahead of the handicap round. Obviously, we've seen um, top trainers in the flat do that in, in in terms of the preparation. You run them over a shorter trip when they're immature, and then they step up a trip that's in line with their breeding, they tend to improve. With hurdlers and chasers, it's a slightly different kettle of fish because they're further on in terms of their development. But if you know they'll stay, you can keep your light under a bushel a little bit by running them over shorter trips. And it's essentially, you're you're giving them more chance of, uh, of staying ahead of the handicapper, but also a bit more even a bit more petrol in the tank as well. It's, it's a very fine line, Ruby, isn't it? Because as Rory said, getting into the handicap is key and you need to be running well and yeah, winning. You, you do. And as, as Rory has put it more eloquently than I will be capable of doing it, the other side of the coin is with inexperienced horses that you're trying to get into handicaps, obviously running them in shorter races where they go faster does gain you more experience and can benefit when you step up. So providing you've got a horse with a pedigree that suggests stamina, if you can get that to run three, four times in two, two and a quarter mile races, the experience it'll gain having to go faster means when you step it into a two and a half, three mile handicap, it'll be going much slower, it'll know what it's doing and it's then running at the right trip. So you're going to get the experience and you're also getting the mark. But with the older horses, like should a stair be dropping down the weights for running in two mile races? You would hope not. No. Mm -hmm. no you would hope the handicapper you don't, you don't is able to that, see yeah. that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to run at the right distance as you get older to come down as well. So it's not just as easy as coming down. I would be of the opinion that horses go up so quickly they should be coming down as quickly. Yeah. And we starting to in the UK. We, we had this discussion and it got revolves around Royal Rendezvous and Fakir Dari mm. and have a listen to the discussion we had on it. Like when you look at handicapping, I'd say most of the horses should be coming down in a race. Instead of just one or two going up, they could give Real Steel a, a great chance to come back and. He did eventually, trainer, yeah, yeah. Got got back down, but mm. it's look, it's not an easy thing to do. But to for Matt Twist, he asks, "Is it common? It sounds like it's not for Cheltenham Festival, essentially. Not, not particularly for Cheltenham no. Festival. Obviously, different trainers have, have different methods. It's worth looking at horses who tend to blossom at a certain time of year as well. You'll, you'll often get horses coming back to Cheltenham and refinding their form there when they haven't necessarily shown great form through the winter." Um, that's worth looking at but you know don't look at, at um horses with a with a line of duck eggs thinking aha uh -huh, this is a cunning plan mm. it rarely is yeah. and you look at them usually like live love laugh was a classic example when he would come back under 140 i think or was it 150 when he would come back under one of the numbers he would be bang there as soon as he went over yeah. that number he'd finish seven to eight and it would take four runs to get him back down to that number but he would just be running away and come back down. And when you get down to, I think it was when he got below 140. Yeah. He was down yeah, to A lot of horses are sort of class ceilings. Yeah. You know, when they get out of their class, especially horses who like to dominate. Yeah. You know, when they when they step into a different class, horses who they can't lead or they can't boss in a race, they lose a bit of confidence and they're not so effective. But then, of course, they get beat two or three times, then they'll drop back into the grade that they're effective in and then they'll be more competitive again. That's just a natural thing. That's yeah. not a that's not a messing around with the horses. Just let them run yeah. until they fall back to where they should be and then they get more competitive again. Well, as a relative newcomer to the game, as you said you were, Matt Twist, I hope you were taking that all in. That was quite a detailed answer. Uh, great question, though. Right, next, we're going to hear from Patrick Bradley. Ruby, you've had countless famous victories that you received plenty of praise. Is there any rides from your career that you're particularly proud of that went a bit under the radar. Thank you, Patrick. Great question for Ruby Walsh. Great guitar in the background as well. Ruby? I don't really have an answer. Um, look, I can remember once, Hush that won rides that I should have won on, but to be honest with you, talking about 
thinking that you won on one and then being disappointed because you didn't get enough praise for it. Not for me. You don't have to be disappointed you didn't get enough praise. Look, for you. Self, but self-praise is no praise. So, like, you were doing your job. That's what you were supposed to do. He's saying Roy Keane now. He's just doing his job. He's just doing no, his job, Roy Keane. He's just doing his job. I, know, I hate people saying, oh, I, I was brilliant there, or whatever. No, that's only your opinion about yourself. I, I, I just, no, I, I can't. Nina? Was there any, any you can think of yourself? No, I'll never forget. A, a horse I rode for my dad years ago, and uh, I was doing light on him, and... Um, I had to borrow Paul's saddle, so I borrowed Paul's, Paul's saddle, and I'm up and I'm in the prey ring, and I can't put the bloody steers down. <laughs> she riding up the neck, and I'm heading out looking at Dad, and Dad was like, now, out the back now, tip away or whatever, and I was like, yeah, can you just run in and get me? <laughs> anyway, headed out down to the start, it was too late to go and change my stirrups, and I'm literally riding like Paul out the back and trying not to move, hold on to my neck strap, and uh, sure enough, the horse was brilliant to jump, and literally came to last and said, please don't hit the last. And he got over and I was like, thank God. I got the whole way around. Anyway, he went and won. I was just praising to the Lord, thank God. Like, he didn't make a mistake. But uh, that was one day probably people uh, probably expecting the horses to win. But uh, to me, the whole way around, I was like, all I was trying to do was stay on. But uh, what they say, uh, ride long, live long. Yeah. So essentially, <laughs> to give context, your stirrups right, were short, way... Right, get out quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your, your stirrups were way up higher, so... Would the horse, or should the horse make a mistake, the centre of gravity is getting further and further away, you potentially could just fall off. I, I was riding at a different level. Like, you know, Paul was so used to riding at that length. I am. For me now, I was totally also the pressure on your legs. Yeah. The shorter you ride, the more pressure that you're putting on your legs. So you're getting the higher balance. upside, the balance, and you're having to compress your muscles more to keep <laughs> you where you should be. So um, it was tiring, Nina. It was. <laughs> <laughs> How long, was it a two miler or two mile? Okay, yeah, yeah. well, Lisa was two, not three and a quarter. Oh, so like, like, wait for it to finish. Can you remember the name of the horse? Because I'm going to YouTube Peak this. Peak Raider. Peak, Peak Raider. Raider. Yeah. Okay, we'll keep an eye out for that one. Yeah. Um, Rory, have you any uh, rides you thought you no, would have been no, credited no. for? Oh, clearly, I could go down the Yogi River. I'm not, I'm, okay, I'm we've gonna, done I'm that. Gonna, I'm going to cut that short. Now. Okay. No, I was. Um, uh, I know. If someone came up to you and said, "I saw you ride this horse." And I thought it was a great ride, and you actually thought you did really well. Would you acknowledge that, or would you say thank you? Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> I I met Adrian McGuire once, um, and um, I told him that he'd given uh, the best ride I've ever seen over jumps to a horse called Sira J in the uh, the Topham. It was the John Hughes Memorial, I think, at the time, and it was a, I thought it was the best ride I'd ever seen. No one else I knew, you know, thought were aware of it at all. Um, the horse was hanging all the way up the street. He gave it a tremendous ride. Anyway, I, I met him and I said, I thought the best ride I've ever seen was you riding Sarah J in the John Hughes. And he hugged me. <laughs> he was so delighted. So yeah, well, in fact, he'd had a drink or two as well, hadn't you? But um, he, was, um, he was delighted to hear that. So I'm, I'm glad I said that because yeah. it was one of those rides. I think, you know, it was a really, really tough ride at the time. You can watch it on YouTube, I'm sure. And I think he thought he did a really good job to get this horse home in front. And for someone to mention it and recognise that That's cool. seemed to mean a little bit to him at the time. So I'm glad I said that. Have you ever hugged anyone for saying, well done on a given, <laughs> such a given right? <laughs> not, to, not to remember. Um, but you do. You have a hug. <laughs> have you ever <laughs> hugged anyone? <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, but it means more someone else saying it to you. It than does, yeah. yourself. I thought you are great in Duvan. Watched the race, not backed it. <laughs> great question, Patrick. I'm afraid Ruby, the one you asked, didn't give us an answer, but great answers from, from Nina and Rory, obviously. Um, our next question is from another Patrick. My question is for Nina Carberry. What gave you a bigger thrill, winning at Cheltenham or winning Dancing with the Stars? Patrick, great question. Topical, Nina. Uh, my whole career was riding in Cheltenham and uh, everything was towards Cheltenham. That was our Olympics every year. And to ride my first winner at Cheltenham was probably one of the best feelings I've ever had and uh, an unexpected win as well. So um, for me, I can't I can't even compare, but Dance with the Stars is a completely different situation. I was just every week, I was just delighted I didn't trip up and fall over myself every week. So uh 
it was kind of a, a different situation, but I probably wouldn't swap Chatham, to be honest. I'd like to think, yeah, it's probably uh, Dabaroon, wasn't it? Was the, Dabaroon, the first yeah. winner for, for Paul Nolan. Big price, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 20 to 1. Was that 20. the first Fred Winter or uh, one well, near one, enough? One of the very early. One of the, yeah. 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 the first or the second. Yeah. Mm. It was a big price. So uh, had you ridden him before or how did that how did that come about? No, I was a five pound claimer at the time and uh, um, Paul... Wait, Paul, was, he had damn all weight, hadn't he? I think he was claiming five off 11 stone or something. So he was in at a good, very good weight. He'd ran a good few times, um, placed and ran well. So um, a bit of nicer ground, he improved a lot. So probably didn't need to be claimed off, but it was light. <laughs> Lovely. Very good. A very good win. The first of a few. Uh, Dance with the Stars, just to give context. What do they call that in BBC in the UK? Um, Strictly Come Strictly, 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 Strictly Strictly Dancing. Dancing. So Nina won that in Ireland uh, last year. And what do you get for that? What, what, what do you win for? She'd win Strictly too. Well, you, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I keep on asking Ruby, is he going to go on Dance with the Stars? Mm. On could you not have a chat How over? Could you follow your sister-in-law? <laughs> did you watch her on Dancing with the Stars? I did. Yeah, yeah. but everyone, so could, everything no, can be proved. That's me. Never, never. No. I wouldn't okay. have done it anyway. Definitely no. not. Never. There's a bit of a cha cha in your daughter. There's definitely a cha cha. <laughs> a tango, a pasa doble. I'm pasa doble. Definitely, <laughs> really, the pasa doble. That's well, ask him. No, do you know what? No, we just ask him about modern ball. Modern no. boring, ah. yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Not. We'll just ask you about Annie Power and you'll get the Paso Doble <laughs> anger in you. You're going to ask me about Annie Power again. <laughs> uh, very good question. Thanks very much, Patrick. Um, we're going back to Tractor Ted, a.k.a. Sam Matthews. So there seems to be a trend now where horses are quickly written off after one run. Um, I'm just uh, interested to get your opinion on this and which horses you think pose suddenly good value um, in races where they were considerably shorter before one bad run. For example, you've got Jet Powered, who I really fancy for the Supreme. Suddenly, one bad run, um, he's value. Same with Aplutard, one bad run. See, well, obviously a very bad run but he's now very good value um and just or if there's any other horses that you think also pose good value after one bad run sam matthews fair play double job and well done ruby wash double job and yeah he's, he's asking questions he's on... obviously so bored in that tractor it took him about two minutes to ask a question that could have been asked in five seconds <laughs> you see he tries to draw into your tractor he definitely wears john deere overalls so. well there we go um, uh, the green maybe that's where you got yeah. sucked into that one maybe it is a john deere who cares um but horses being written off that society that's the way we've, we've that's the way the world has gone um be it football teams rugby teams coaches managers trainers horses Jockeys. if it's not up to expectation every day it's history but that's mm. just society so you you think that these horses can be given? Well, of course they can. Yeah. Of course they can. But unfortunately, everything is now about what's next, the here and now. Boom. All right. Okay. Uh, I might ask for one then from you. Uh, but first, I'll go to Nina. I think the same. It's just the way things have gone, and uh, yeah, like for whatever reason, the horses ran bad or ground or different situations, and uh, could be bad scope, and we don't know, you know. So. Mm. Um, yeah, there could be value there, but I actually can't think one. One, what, I was gonna say, one, <laughs> one to come to mind. Is there a previous one you thought of? Like, oh, how did that go off? Just because it ran badly in the pillar chase or the console chase or whatever that's called. Or well, the form figures in the Cheltenham would be maybe a bit different. I mean, the amount of horses who have finished out of the first four going to Cheltenham that have actually gone and won is tiny, tiny. Mm. tiny. But now more so through a season, I'd say it's probably more. Rory. Do you rule horses out? Are you happy to rule them out after one bad run? No, certainly not. But at the same time, yeah, it's you have to ask the question uh, with a with the good runs in the first place. How good was that run? Um, and um, I'm not sure how Jet Park Jet Park is, for example. Yeah. I mean, fair play. If Jet Park goes and wins the Supreme, then I, I doff my John Deere cap. Yeah. Fast of Vegas probably a good one. Fast of Vegas is a good example, but yeah. also a good example of how if if the horse is in the spotlight and you're getting the excuses after the race. The horse doesn't drift as much as it might. Like Fasal Vega immediately took a bit of a walk in the market. And and then um, Willie was critical of the ride. Uh, and then it turned out that the horse had finished lane. So you had two reasons why he might the, the, the form might not be correct. And the horses then came, came back in on the back of the, the um, Willie's judgment of the ride. And then he came in further uh, when it turned out that he'd been lame. But it's still both, they're still negatives regarding his chance. So it's interesting how the public reacts to, to information that's not just in the public domain, but in the spotlight. 
Um, and it's often when, the, when that isn't in the spotlight that you can find excuses. So if, you can, if you've seen horses that have run poorly but have got um, valid excuses that maybe aren't being talked about um, or that you, know, you have to dig to find, then that can give you a little bit of value. But as Ruby says... For every one that does pop up and win after a bad run, you know, there are dozens that disappoint again because people are going, well, that wasn't great, but let's give it another go at Cheltenham. Cheltenham's not the best place in the world to give it another go. Um, ideally, you want to get back on track before you go there. Fair enough. Good question. Thanks for our visit to the tractor again, <laughs> Sam. Uh, next, we have Philip again. Second question for Nina. Uh, straightforward one. Would you have won the champion hurdle on Archibald? Nina! My word, this would be an interesting answer at the dinner table. He probably would have finished last because I would have hit him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was the type of horse he was. He was a real bridle horse. He would loads of class, but he gave everything on the bridle, nothing off it, really. So, uh, no, I probably would have finished way further back, to be honest. Really? You wouldn't finish further back. Well, like... You would have given him the same ride, essentially, right? Not, not really. I think, no? to be honest, Paul had more balls than me, so... Uh, um, hope he had. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was funny. Um, I definitely wouldn't have. No. Okay, you wouldn't have. All right. Okay. Those uh, the bridal horse, the bridal merchants, whatever they call them, Ruby. A lot of people throw names at the likes of Archibald. So actually, back to you, Nina. He was just giving everything, wasn't he? He just yeah, that was like, it. It wasn't like he wasn't trying. And as well just... as that, Paul was probably squeezing it as well. Paul did a lot uh, without anyone thinking that he was. He was one of those riders that got a lot out of them without, you know... Without looking like it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, it's hard for a punter to watch that, though, because yeah, every other horse... There's not many riders like that around, you know, so they're not used to it. And, uh, no, he was probably one of the best at it. Yeah, cracking horse, Archibald. Great question, yeah. Philip. You could have caused a few issues there. At the was the third horse that got the bad ride in that race. But there you go. Which was? Brevenka. He was back in third and hard use. Oh, my word. What a, what a, what a era that was. Um, Vernon, next question from you. One of my favourite horses was Guard Champetra, and I guess also one of Nina's. Um, the horse that had limited success in the hands of Paul Nichols and John Joe O'Neill. So, Nina, I was wondering, how did Edna Bolger go about transforming the horse into a multiple cross-country winner? Great question, that one from Vernon Grant. What a horse Guard Champetra was. Brilliant horse. Hang on, hang on. Vernon there. Sorry, Vernon. But limited success with Paul Nichols. We only had him for a season. He was million in mind. <laughs> Yeah. So he was fifth in the Supreme, he won the Mersey, and then he had to go to the sales. So Paul Nichols only had him for one year. I'd say he did a pretty good job of it for the How year. many he winners? Had... How many times did he win? One? He won once. more than once. I won him somewhere else. Uh, I'd say he might have had four runs. He could have won two and could have two novice hurl at the um, Entry Festival Entry, yeah. and turned him into a horse of extreme value for his owners, the Million of Mind Syndicate. <laughs> they nearly got a million, didn't they? Well, yeah. half, halfway, halfway. But how did Ender Bulger do it? How, because he was a classy novice, but he became a, a cross-country legend. Well, Ender's brilliant at transforming those horses, giving them um, a new lease of life. Um, he, I think John Thomas had a lot to do with him as well. He schooled him a lot over the ditches and, and uh, the hedges at home. And uh, yeah, he did a lot of schooling for me, but I was lucky at the time there was Lammy, there as well so I got the ride in Garda and uh, yeah the two of us kind of came head to head a good few times but uh, uh, he was an amazing horse but yeah Enda has a brilliant knack of just reviving those horses and getting them to he actually didn't have a whole lot of scope he was a horse that was not overly big if you can remember mm -hmm. he was and he only had his he'd like to go in and pop rather than big extravagant jumps but uh, I think the the cross country fence has really suited him because he flicked through the, the laurel hedges so he really enjoyed it then, you know, so probably that was probably more so the improvement in him. Could they have a cross country race at End of Bulgers? I've heard that this this track he has is unbelievable. Could they literally have a race down there? Um, no. I don't, not no? really. It's a bit tight. Like, okay, right. But you can jump have to about... cross the avenue and, yeah. and the house and go through the garden to get well, back That's cross country. <laughs> that's cross country. No. Yeah. You well, want to see the way he keeps the avenue and the garden and everything. There's yeah, no way yeah. to be horses no. jumping across that. <laughs> he has off a my figure grass. of eight, so he keeps going around. And I think he can jump about 30 without even stopping. So it's great for a horse to get into a rhythm. It's like Fontwell, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or Old Windsor. Um, best cross country horse you rode? Was it him or Lamy or? You didn't yeah, get the right spot. The difference that was always that was John. The Thomas, JT, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so which, sorry, which was the best cross country? Oh, it has to be Garda, yeah. Yeah. How many did you win that challenge on him? I think he won three. Was it two or three? Including a few others the, yeah, on the yeah. way as well. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad. Bring back those days, the end of Bulger days. Great question, Vernon. Well done, uh, and uh, Ruby as ever interjecting. Next one, David Atkinson, back again. Has anybody heard our plus tardies, and is last year's Cheltenham Gold Cup form 
still the best piece of foam for this year's renewal. Great question, David. To Ruby Walsh. A Plutar. Funny, I happened to ask Robert Power how he was Sunday, Saturday. What day were we at? Last weekend. Last weekend. And um, he was very happy. He said he seems to be in great form at home in Knockin. So, look, he obviously has that blowout at, in the hay, at Haydock. He banged his joint before Christmas, didn't get to run there. Has he the mileage in the clock to win a Gold Cup? I don't know, Rory. I suppose Abu Foto won it off just one prep run um, mm. in a season, so maybe it can be. Best mate was. That was kind of Christmas time. Yeah, but he'd have had more than one run. Yeah, I mean, run two since runs. Christmas, he? But he yeah, two he, runs. He always had. He always had. The, you know the plans. Yeah. Uh, mile. Uh, Bob's worth one of a of, of, uh, interrupted preparation. He, he won the Hennessy and then was off before the Gold Cup. Yeah. So, so it can be the same done. sort of same sort yeah. of timeline. It can be done. Um, is last year's form is. I think that yeah. piece of form from last year. From physically to watch it, I thought it was a, a very good performance, and I think that form is quite strong. When yeah. you see the distance he won by, yes, yeah, remarkable high far he won by. Given it looks like it's going to be yeah. a punch finish between the last two fences, and he ended up winning what seventeen lengths. Seventeen lengths. Manila Indo has beaten Statler Tremor since Protector at won the Betfair Chase since. Like they are what second and third, and he's seventeen lengths in yeah. front of that when he's right. Do you think they went too quick though? That I, don't, I don't think they were stopping him behind. That's the thing. No. I think he he's I, I liked him a lot as a. Um, he won as a five-year-old in the Novice Handicap yeah. Chase. And that was that was the day there were only the two finishers in the National Hunt Chase, which was the race after. The ground had got very bad at that stage and nothing was quickening out of it. They were all slowing at the end of the race. And he's actually quickened over the last two that day. Yeah. And I thought this has to be a grade one horse to quicken at the end of a race like that. And he's, he's well, I mean, it's a few years later now, but he's he's done that again. Because um, he is a proper stayer. Yeah. But he's a, he's a stayer who actually can quicken at the end of his races. So that is, that's... Very strong form. The question is, can he can he repeat it off the preparation he's had? And we don't really know until we see him. Nobody, you know? nobody will know until That's the Friday. That's the beauty. It is the beauty. Yeah, that is the beauty. That's the idea. Uh, great question, Dave. Very nice. One more question. This one comes from Eva. Question is to Ruby and Nina. Who is the most influential person in your racing career? Thank you, Eva Corrigan. Ruby Walsh, most influential person in your career. Oh, my dad, without doubt, yeah. shaped my career as a jockey since I was probably younger than when I had a licence, but yeah, he was huge in my career, simple and as. Well, obviously, he had the amateur career, which um, different times maybe, that was, you were always going to go pro, you would never have thought, I'll do the amateur thing. And I didn't know, um, no. his dad encouraged me to, he hadn't turned pro, so it was, it was his encouragement to turn pro and Willie's. Um, but yeah, look, dad shaped, shaped my career as a jockey and was the biggest influence on me. Yeah, no Why doubt. didn't he go pro, do you know? That was different times yeah. and the perception that if you couldn't do 10 stone in weight or less you couldn't really make it as a professional um, and obviously had the handicap system changed over years weights changed and um, your weight didn't become the same issue and heavier jockeys turned professional when I did. In terms of his influence on, on your racing career um, bollockings were there a few? Yeah. Yeah? Considerable. <laughs> but there's no point in somebody giving you um, criticism and critiquing what you're doing if you're not going to listen to it mm. and take it in. It's one thing pretending you're listening and then knowing nothing about it. But if you're not taking what corrective criticism you're being given on board, you cannot get better unless you're taking that. Mm. And being a professional sports person or a sports person of any, I suppose in life even, Rory, mm. If you're doing things wrong and people are saying to you, you got that wrong, that wrong and that wrong, that's why, that's what you do. If you're not prepared to take that on board, you never want to get any better. I'm going to go to Nina next, but have a think about maybe one of those pieces of advice that Ted gave you and you, and you put it into practice the next time. Like, brilliant. Cheers, Dad. Nina, most influential person. Definitely my dad and Paul. Uh, for me, Dad was always a man of very little words. He always... Same as Paul. Very, very little words. So he'd always were just take in whatever he said because he was just a master of tactics as well for me to watch, even watch him back. And definitely Paul, he modelled my style. I modelled my style on, on him and uh, I have a lot to thank for him To I think for a lot of jockeys probably looked up to him for the style and the way. It was very hard to, to emulate him, but uh, he gave me, I suppose, that mentoring that I wanted to be something like him. And when you were on the car home or you got home after the races or whatever it was and you're sitting down for dinner as a family, is it just literally talking about what happened on the race course that day? Is it 
No, it was totally no? different. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, when did the racing chats happen then? Not really. Not many. Not, really? Like, it was more probably hunting on that with the ponies, to be honest. <laughs> Ted, our Paul was probably around 10 years older than me. So anytime he came, he was in England, based in England for a lot of my childhood. When he come home, you know, by the Sundays, we were only racing here. So we'd um, meet up and we'd head out probably on the on the hunters every Sunday morning. And I would just live for these days. Like, you know, we'd be watching them. So that uh, it was probably something that always lived with me and I'm grateful for it. Okay. So All that grounding I got from him. Okay. I know you weren't called out, Rory, but most influential person in your career in racing. Yeah, again, again I'd, I'd say my dad because he was the one I got my interest in, in racing from. He wanted one of his children to share his interest in racing. That is a test on the nineteen seventy seven Grand National. <laughs> I, I Did he sit you all day? I watched the wheel. Well, he, he he had a pound or a fifty p each way um, on a horse for um, I don't know whether it was all four of the children or whether it was the three boys, um, but um, one didn't watch. One backed Andy Pandy and turned away in disgust after it her second time around. And I had red rum, so I stayed ah, to the end, wondering, well, wondering whether he'd finished third behind the loose horses or he'd actually won. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, that was me, and and from then on, um, you know, we didn't we talked about racing. We didn't talk about what whatever fathers and sons are meant to talk about. Um, but you don't racing, yeah, you know, racing yeah, is yeah, pretty yeah. much what it should be, uh, and that's that that sort of was was what we did, and we watched the the ITV racing as it was then, um, back in the in the eighties, and a, a, you know, um, a great time to to watch racing as well, and that encouraged me to. To have an interest, and eventually, after trying to find a respectable career, it got me got me back into to racing from a writing and broadcasting side. So that's respectable, respectable career. Well, I worked in the civil service for a while. You know, oh here, kind of oh here now. Uh, it's yeah. amazing how many of these stories you hear about got me into racing. Stay the Grand National the still no. is mentioned, yeah. and it's just oh, you pound in the Grand National fifty p each way or whatever it is, and it just happens down time and time again. I think you rode in it as well. What was your first Grand National memory? First Grand National memory is 80... No, 89 was Ryan Reason, wasn't it? Yeah. 85, West Tip, I think, is my first Grand National memory. I think I remember 86, before that. 86. 86. 85 was Last Suspect. Sure, I don't old. remember 85, Last Suspect, even though was he in the Dutch West? Was he Dutch was, yeah. West, I can vaguely remember that. 86, West Tip. Lovely. All right. Great question. Thank you very much, Aoife Corrigan. That's a wrap. Uh, thanks very much, Nina, in particular, uh, for coming on and joining the two lads. Uh, as ever, do check out the Paddy Power Racing YouTube channel if you're listening to this as a podcast. This and plenty more besides Shark Power featuring John Joseph Allen, aka The Shark, and Paddy Power uh, Hewick. Fingers crossed he makes it to the Gold Cup. What a story that is. Paddy and himself documented that over a very tasty looking breakfast. Also, as always, the Chetland Countdown podcasts are available on that on the Racing YouTube channel as well. So it will be very nice to all of the, the panellists or the punter, punters who sent in the questions. Thanks very much for being going easy on them. But they were questions. They weren't statements. They were questions. Proper questions they were yes. too. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much. He saves it for me. Nina, thanks very much for coming no in, problem, as always. And Rory, thanks very much for sticking Fine, around. Pleasure. Yogi, a highlight. Fantastic. Is he still Absolutely. around? I, I guess he's not no, still I, around. No, I very much thought Yogi's still around. I still right. can't believe you thought that the horse he rode in 1977 <laughs> was named after Yogi Breisner <laughs> and not Yogi De Vere. <laughs> I mean, there you go. It wasn't 1970, but, it was but I can't, 1990, yeah. 1990. Well, I can't believe you brought it up. Thank really you very nice. much, yeah, Ruby Walsh. Thanks very much, folks, for tuning in. I'm sure we'll do this again. Thanks very much for all the questions you sent in. Uh, really good fun. Until next time. But he's a champion.